So when we look at um, lumbar bone stress injuries across Australian uh, cricket, Anthony Lucenti, who's a Cricket Victoria physio, he uh, spoke recently about a study he's been doing where he looked at the last four years across Australian cricket in our senior programs, and he found 41 bowlers that had gone on to develop a lumbar, uh, lumbar spine stress uh, injury, whether that be a stress reaction or stress fracture in the last four years. And we had 31 males and 10 females. And what he did is he crunched the data from our athlete management system, which is our online system, and he found that a majority of these um, fast bowlers were under 22. A majority had had a previous lumbar spine stress fracture. So if you develop a lumbar spine stress fracture as a youngster, it's not the end of the world. We can hopefully try and get them to heal. But it does make you a little bit more susceptible to developing one um, when you're a little bit older. And so hopefully by picking up some of these lumbar stress fractures or early signs of lumbar stress um, earlier, we can hopefully then try and develop more, se more robust senior cricketers. Now, as you guys may mention, there were some technical issues that were, were going on um, in these, fast, these 41 fast bowlers. Um, I won't touch on it much. I know Mark's got a couple of slides coming up that he'll, he'll uh, discuss around that more from a um, technical aspect. But the majority had lateral flexion greater than 30 degrees and or shoulder counter rotation greater than 30 degrees. And we know from some of the biomechanical stuff that you know greater than 30 degrees is considered high risk. 25 to 29 is a medium risk and less than 25 is low. And again, that some bowlers who are classified as having a mixed action um, are more likely to produce lateral flexion or shoulder counter rotation greater than 30 degrees. So that's all I'm going to touch on on that. As I said, I'm a sports physio, not a fast bowling coach. So um, another point that Anthony found in, in his uh, recent study was that fast bowlers that went on to develop lumbar stress fracture had reduced hip strength, particularly in hip abduction and hip extension. And then when we talk about bowling, bowling, he found that the number of balls bowled in 12 weeks, so if you bowl greater than 900, the majority of uh, stress fractures in this cohort had that as a, as a contributing factor. And days bowled or the frequency of bowling, if they bowled greater than 24 sessions in 12 weeks. Now, it doesn't seem a lot when you think about it, you know, 24 in 12 weeks, it's only twice a week. So we'll try and touch on that a little bit further as we continue on. And thankfully, some of these risk factors that Anthony found in his most recent study here, if we move forwards, we find that that sits with some of the really well-established contributing factors for lumbar spine stress fractures. So the main thing I want you guys as coaches to take away from this slide is there's lots of things that can contribute to a lumbar spine stress injury. You know? A lot of these things you as a coach can't control or can't even measure. You know, but the main thing is to be aware that lots of these things can contribute. And that's why I said earlier, it, it depends. It depends on the numerous circumstances or the individual circumstances that can contribute. But if, if we do have a look, as you say, this age, less than 22, some biomechanical stuff that we made mention, some other physio screening based or, you know, gym based S&C stuff, and then some bowling load stuff. Uh, if we move forwards, what I'll do is briefly touch on this study, okay? So this was a study done by some of my colleagues up at Cricket Australia fairly recently. And what they did is they monitored 65 of um, our elite junior fast bowlers with regular MRI scans across, you know, an eight month cricketing season. And what they found, they were, they monitored these players and they were having a look at what was going on in, inside them um, in terms of from a bony health perspective. And they only stopped or pulled out or let them know what was going on after they, the player had reported pain or discomfort symptoms. You know, go to a, go to their state physio, yeah, I've got a sore back and I can't bowl anymore. And what they found is bone marrow edema is a precursor to lumbar uh, bone stress fracture. So 15 of the 65 went on to get a lumbar stress fracture and all of them had bone marrow edema before getting that stress fracture. However, Bone marrow edema was detected on average, you know, three to four months prior to getting a symptomatic lumbar stress fracture. So that, when I mentioned earlier that pain is an unreliable source, this study sort of leans its way towards that, you know, and at 50% of these asymptomatic elite young fast bowlers had some level of abnormal bone marrow edema at the end of the season. So what do we take away from this or what do I do take away from this? You know, bone marrow edema is common. 
Okay, and the racial ratio that we measure is, is useful for physios and doctors to manage. However, lumbar spine screenings can be useful to try and help prevent some, if not, but not all of these lumbar stress fractures. So what we're actually doing in some of our um, practice is actually screening our young fast bowlers at the end of the season and seeing how, seeing whether or not they do have any, any edema in their back. And what we're actually doing is just giving them a little bit more time to let that settle before we get them back bowling again. So traditionally, you used to have cricket in the winter, you play, uh, sorry, footy in the winter, you play cricket in the summer, and you had clearly delineated seasons. Now, cricket nowadays is going on 12 months of the year. You have, I'm sure you guys out there as coaches have probably got young fast bowlers that will go on tours pre-COVID, you know, international tours in the, in the winter months. And so what we're finding is that we can hopefully try and pick up some of these earlier, give them a little bit more rest before they start bowling again, and to try and prevent them from having six to 12 months out of, out of the game. Because what we do know from, some of the, from a study like this is that bony healing takes a really long time. And in this study, you know, it took up to 203 days. What that means is traditionally we used to think, all right, well, you get a lumbar stressy, we'll give you three months, and then we'll get you back bowling again, you'll be good to go. But we know that from, as we said, that these things take a long time to heal. And we think that's sometimes one of the contributing factors here that why we don't get these to heal and why that if you've had a lumbar stressy in the past can contribute you to getting one when you reach a senior level like mine. Now, what this study did find is that some of the likely predictors of bone stress injury were more bowling days across a preseason with less rest and also less rest during the, um, during the mid season or the Christmas period. And what they did find is that, you know, some unlikely or trivial predictors that you guys might have thought about, you know, how many balls you bowl in a session, how many balls you bowl in a week, what your acute chronic workload ratio is, you may have heard of that or not, um, was unlikely in this, in this situation. So if we move forwards and just recap some of that, or what, what I take away from a study like this is that young fast bowlers with less days between bowling are a risk factor for bone stress injury. So... Bowlers who bowl more regularly are at, a risk, at risk with less rest. Rest periods are protective and that young fast bowlers need recovery days. And this will hopefully fit in with, we'll go forwards and try and talk about some bone sensitivity and, and what bone loading does going forwards. But it does sort of build on a little bit of framework around alternative bowling days whenever possible. Now, Mark will touch on some bowling workloads and stuff later on and we really didn't want to get into a bowling workload chat tonight, but we will talk on some of these other factors as we build, build forwards. Now, age, you guys were thought to sit in the middle of the presentation in the, in the mentee there, it wasn't number one, but this figure here shows that young fast bowlers miss a significant number of matches due to bone injury. So this big giant, the giant red triangle there. And in fact, bowlers that were under the age of 22 are almost four times more likely to suffer a bone stress injury than the other other age groups there. So age has something to do with developing in injury. And that's got to do with this concept of peak height velocity and young fast bowlers and wh when your young fast bowlers are growing. So we know that males reach their um, peak age of growth around about 15 to 17 years of age. Females a little bit earlier at 12 to 14. And that average growth spurt can last between you know, 24 and 36 months. So you can see on the graphs there that that peak height velocity or where these young fast bowlers are growing, growing really, really quickly. And I like the saying there, they grow long before they grow strong. A uh, adolescent, will, when they're at their peak height velocity, will have reached about 90% of their adult height, but only acquired about 57% of their total bone mineral density. So what I mean by that is if we move forwards onto the next slide, that bone is relatively weak during growth. We know that it can take, or the bone, bone strength takes six to eight years after that rapid period of growth to reach adult levels. And in females, this generally occurs around about 18, and males, this generally occurs about 22 to 24 years old. And that lag between bone growth and that bone mineral density leaves young bones relatively weak and at greater risk of fracture. Now, when you think about fast bowling, you know, you're 90% of your adult height, you've got long levers, you're coming in, charging in. We know that 
you know, you take anywhere between five and 11 times your body weight on front foot impact, some of that load ends up getting transferred up to the spine. Now, if you've, you're long, but you're not very strong, you know, that can cause a problem and can, can contribute to force going through that, that young, growing, fast bowler. And this here, this really highlights the difference between that, the two and the weakness that goes on. So on the left, we have an MRI scan of a young 16-year-old fast bowler. And on the right, we have a, a 24 or, or more um, developed fast bowler. And what I want you guys to try and look at is the white stuff. What the white stuff is, is cortical bone. And hopefully you can see a difference between the thickness of the white stuff on the left compared to the white stuff on the right. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about Bob the Builder and, um, and Pac-Man. Over time, Bob starts to lay down really thick, healthy bones, which enables these young fa fast bowlers or, or older fast bowlers to tolerate some of the demands that we expect of them at senior cricket level. Uh, if we move forwards. What I will mention about bowling loads here is that high medium term loads, so bowling greater than 150 overs in three months on low career workloads is a risk factor for bone stress. But we do know that career workloads greater than 1200 uh, overs are highly protective. So when I talk about that, you know, high medium term loads, that's a young, you know, 19 year old fast bowler that gets picked in the shield side that bowls three shield games back to back to back. You know, it's also potentially that under 19 fast bowler that you've got playing at your club who bowls on a Saturday and bowls 20 overs for grade cricket, then he's picked in a second 11 game and he might bowl 40 overs during the week. And then he's then got to go and play um, a one day game the following week weekend and could any, hold anywhere between, you know, 60 to 60 to 70 overs in a week there for that that young fast bowler and we're talking about greater than 150 overs in a three month period, month period here so the challenge here is you know or the interpretation what i take away from this is is it takes years for bone to adapt to the demands of fast bowling it doesn't happen overnight it does take time i'm sure mark will sort of try and touch on some um other bowling load stuff later on as we as we build into it now this is a key point to me. Adolescence is the time where bone's most responsive to loading. And it provides this absolute wonderful window of opportunity to improve bone strength. Also, it gives you a really nice opportunity to improve technique, muscle strength, enjoyment in the game. You know, so this adolescence window period is a really, really crucial opportunity in, in development, not only on the park, but also physiologically as well. We head forwards. Some other stuff that's really important not to forget is nutrition. As I mentioned before, Bob the Builder needs needs crucial elements to help him do his job. And some of that stuff is things like protein and calcium. So, you know, we need to make sure that these young, growing, developing bodies have the right amount of f food and the right amount of fuel to be able to ensure that they're able to, to do what they need to do, and that's grow and get stronger. Um, I'm sure, I think Mark made mention that you'll, you'll have some stuff in the handout for the coaches later on. Some of this stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to provide this for everyone at the end, which is some really kind of basic uh, nutrition guidelines that we use for our for our academy players as well. Um, thank you, Kieran. That was that was like detailed and and unashamedly scientific because I think we need to understand that there's actually been a lot of work that has gone into fast bowling safety over the last. 25 years and it's continuing and it will continue do we have all the answers at the moment no uh, are we learning as much as we can every year yes um so from from the point of the science i i think that that made a well it was certainly interesting for me and it, I, I think it um hopefully was interesting for you guys as well and hopefully provide some background in regard to some of the the technical risk factors that we have spoken about you know there's there's certainly counter rotation um, it's kind of one of those terms that people know the words but don't quite understand what it is. So I'm, I'm just going to quickly go through it and try and explain it a little bit. It's, it's the difference between the angles of your shoulders, a back foot landing, so when your back foot hits the ground. So I think Brett Lee in the, in the top right photo compared with the most open phase of your delivery stride. So I think the bottom photo in Brett Lee here. 
So if you have a look at where his shoulders are at back foot landing and where they point, and then have a look at where his shoulders point if you were to put a rod between the two of them and see where that is, the difference of that angle. And I'll show you in the next photo, a slight, in the next slide, a slightly easier way of seeing it. Basically, the amount of rotation the spine completes while under load. So that under load being that back foot hits the ground, force goes through the leg and into the spine, and that's that's the load that it's doing. And then the spine starts to counter rotate. All bowlers actually counter rotate. Side on bowlers do it when they're in the air. So as you can see from Brett Lee, who's a semi open style bowler, he actually keeps the ball in really close to his body next, next to his right hip, and he pulls his right shoulder back. So that actually gets his shoulders in a little bit more of a side on position. Now, greater risk is when counter rotation is greater than 35 degrees. So what you'll see in the next photo is at back foot landing, you can have a look at where the angle of his shoulders might be. Let's guess and say that it's roughly 70 degrees from the batter. Okay, so there's a, probably a 70 degree angle from his right shoulder to his left shoulder in comparison to the batter or the opposition stumps. From there, you look at roughly where his most open position. And if we had to guess, we'd say that might be 20 degrees towards the batter. So what's the difference between those two numbers is about 50 degrees. So his, his counter rotation is 50 degrees here. Now, as mentioned by Kieran, you know, the risk increases at around 30%, uh, 30 degrees. So what does this mean for us as coaches? You know, we, we want them semi-open, we want them side on, or we want that back shoulder nice and, and, and we want to try and get them to hide that back shoulder from the batter uh, when they land. But this isn't really a conversation around technique. Um, but the easiest way that we can identify it is through video. But we can also look, uh, it's very hard to look on the naked eye, but if you see typically young kids do this quite significantly, if you can see that that hand sticking right out in front at back foot landing, there's a pretty fair chance that those shoulders are very front on, which means that they're like very likely to go through an awful lot of counter rotation. It probably also means that they end up in the position in, in, in the picture E here where they've kind of fallen away and, and collapsed a fair bit as well. But that is for another time. At the same point, we've got lateral flexion. Now, lateral flexion is simply leaning over when we let, when we let go of the ball. The more lateral flexion, the more risk. As, as dictated by Lockie Ferguson, it's not a predictor of poor performance, nor is counter rotation, mind you. It's just a risk factor for injury. So let's let's go and recap a little bit more. So re, one, one thing we haven't spoken about, and I did want to mention, is really good fast bowlers play in lots and lots and lots of cricket teams. Um, think juniors, seniors, rep, school, I think school reps, I think private private coaching, you name it, they're in it. Um, I think New South Wales Academies, you know, we're, we're a part of this, this mess as well. You know, during this time, fast bowlers are growing rapidly with less dense bones, 57% as, as, as an adult. Really good fast bowlers generally bowl really fast, okay? That, that increases force through the low back. Fast bowlers are playing lots of teams, bowl a lot of balls. Right? And we know that medium term loads are an issue. And all of these are compounding risk factors for lumbar stress injuries. Okay, Fast bowlers that get lumbar stress injuries don't play finals, people. You really, really want your fast bowlers to play finals. The goal is to have them finish the year. So what can we control? Some of those things we can't control. We can't control their age. Um, we can't control their longitudinal foot arch. I, I, I think I mentioned, I think I read in one of those slides that Kieran provided. We can't control a lot of things. And as as coaches, particularly um, particularly in community sport, we can't measure a lot of the things that get measured in, a, in an elite high performance uh, unit. So what can we control out of all of this? You know, I think the one thing we can control is their road to load. You know, that window of opportunity. Now, I really like this slide because this is my favourite kids' book. I would like to read this to my kids. But, you know, Other Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss. You know, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know and you're the guy or girl who will decide where to go. We can dictate how we load our quicks however we choose. We can choose to bowl them every day. We can choose to bowl them really long spells. We can choose to bowl them twice a week. We can choose to 
um, run shorter spells. We can choose to break them up. We can play games as opposed to nets. We can do all sorts of things in order to try and manage these quicks through a season so they can play the next one. Um, I'm going to hand over back to Kieran to talk around season on season loads and how we try and do it at New South Wales Cricket. But this is the part that we can actually control and this is the part where I actually think makes a reasonable difference because we can actually do something about it. Yeah, thanks. So I agree with that, Mark. So like at New South Wales, we sort of have a philosophy that bowlers should bowl as much as possible throughout a season to get better. If your bowlers aren't bowling, they're not getting better. And, but each bowler will have an individualised capacity for loading. And as Mark may mention there, that depends on things like bowling speed, technique, their fitness levels, what their injury history is like and what their bowling history is like. And year, yearly bowling load history can help inform player and coach expectations for an upcoming season. Now, we know that bankers or experienced bowlers can help protect younger bowlers and then an accumulation of multiple good seasons can help prepare bowlers for the next year. And that we believe that long-term fast bowling development aims to maximise bowling exposure to an individual capacity across a year and across a career. So moving forwards, credit for this slide here should go to Danny Redrup, who is the former New South Wales physio and is the current Sydney Sixers physio. And what we've got here is what we consider the New South Wales fast bowler life cycle. So even at the senior level, we have expectations or a framework that we utilise of where our bowlers sit across their, their life cycle as a fast bowler. So we can see we have some expectations or, you know, aims that we hope for some of our younger bowlers, so at a development level. And then as they start to progress, come a little bit older in 1922, they start to hit that emerging uh, level. From there, stage three is our performing age. So hopefully by then we, we've got some regular um, regular shield loads. And then stage four is our elite. That's our Australian players. And then moving forwards from there, we start to get a mentor age. And there's some more of our senior bowlers or bankers, as I made mention, that have been around and can help protect. And not only help protect from a physical perspective, but also pass on a lot of wisdom and knowledge from a, from a bowling perspective. So moving forwards, this here, is the last year's bowling data from the New South Wales Blues. Yeah, and we're really lucky, like we, we are able to utilize GPS, which helps to assist the accuracy of our data here. Um, and we know that the, the average match balls or the red numbers here is about 2000 match balls. So if you're a regular shield bowler or a regular player in the New South Wales squad, you generally bowl around about 2000 match balls a year. And that's been pretty consistent over the last eight years. And what we take from this or what we look to do is to try and know the demands of our athletes. And for you guys as coaches is to have some level of knowledge of what your athletes are, what your athletes actually do. So when we move to the next few couple of slides here, what you'll see here is we've highlighted three bowlers. So Hadley Hatcher, Mickey Edwards, and they're hopefully sitting around that emerging bowlers, you know, aiming for that 1500 to 2000 match ball seasons. And they're playing grade cricket, second 11, hopefully pushing to try and play the odd shield game here or there. When we look at the next three bowlers here, we've got Abbott, Conway and Copeland. Now these guys have been regular shield bowlers. You know, they're performing or mentor bowlers and they regularly hit that 2000 match balls, a year, match balls a year. When we look at the big three here, so Cummins, Hazelwood and Stark, we can see for these guys, you know, they're hitting that 3,000, 4,000 balls, balls a season. And a lot of their, their split is actually match balls compared to training balls, you know. Same thing for us. We always have an emphasis on match balls, you know. We want guys to be playing cricket first and foremost over training. And But when we look at, if we go just forward one, yep, just that would be good. All of the New yeah. South Wales bowlers last year bowled greater than 200 balls in a week at some stage during during the year. Now, these guys are elite train, training. No, you're right, Mark. Go to the next one, you know. These guys are, you know, all of the guys in our squad have access to physio, S&C, regular coaching, lots of training. You know, they're really fit frontline bowlers, and they all bowl 200 balls in a week. When we look at our frontline bowlers, they're getting up around about 320 balls in a week. And all of them in their busiest month, 
bowled more than 2,000, uh, 200 balls on, on average. All I want you to do with those numbers is is just to know that the demands are individualised across our squad. You know, so what Ryan Hadley does is very different to what Pat Cummins does. Now, this graph here, or well, these two graphs here, what you can see is two left-handed fast bowlers who are in our squads. Now, both of these fast bowlers have very different stories. They've got very different bowling histories, and they've got very different injury histories for different reasons. But if Mitch was to get injured and we need a left arm quick, you know, how much or how relevant is it to expect Ben to be able to step up and play 10 Shield games next year? When we look at his loading or his bowling history, we can see that Ben over the last few years has, has sort of averaged or, or got through around about 1,000 match balls a year. Now, as I said, regular Shield bowlers play double that. So, you know, when we're talking or when we're discussing some of our fast bowler life cycle, we utilise some of this information to try and make smart decisions and informed decisions about the best way to take Ben from where he is currently to try and get him to be like Mitchell Stark from a bowling workload perspective in terms of what can what can he tolerate and, and how do we get him along this this uh, this life cycle as a fast bowler. When we look at the women's game, it's a similar individualised approach across the year. Now, breakers, they only play, you know, 10 over or 4 over games, so they, they can't bowl, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 overs in a, in a game. But the same thing here in is that you know so their numbers are lower but the same thing here is what what they expect a senior fast bowler in the women's program to do is different to what they expect a young uh, fast bowler in the women's game to do now i mentioned a lot before about physiology and bone growth and and bony health and things like that now as I said, we know that bowling is a dynamic stimulus, you know, and I said before that fast bowling provides, you know, quite a lot of force at front foot impact, which also contributes to high strain rates, which stimulates bone formation. It's a good thing, you know, we want Bob the Builder to, to work his uh, magic over over the, these developing ages with a young fast bowler. As I said, showed earlier, those two MRIs of a 16-year-old and a 24-year-old. But the challenge is and nothing stimulates bone like bowling does, but that's the challenge. That's the that's the magic, the Goldilocks uh, component there, where not too much, not too not too hot, not too cold, just right. So the challenge for us is to get you know how much bowling is enough to help get this really healthy stiff bony growth and bony stimulus. We know that the longer you load bone, the less it, less sensitive it becomes. And for young fast bowlers, it means after a certain number of deliveries there's going to be no further bony adaptation. Now, the more you bowl, chances are you get a bit fatigued, which might make it a bit harder to maintain that action that you guys made, made mention of before. We don't know exactly the number of, you know, how much is too much, but we sort of think that, you know, 30 to 40 consecutive deliveries is sort of hitting that right spot in terms of just from a pure stimulus in a session. It's important to think about rest, because what rest does is it enables bone sensitivity to re return. So for you guys as coaches, you think about what your session looks like, what your week looks like, what the month looks like, and what the season looks like for these, these fast bowlers in your programs. We know that recovery periods across the season are extremely important. Now, what are we doing? As I said earlier, we, have, we had 10 lumbar stresses in our pathway program. So what we would try to do is basically look back at some of our contributing factors in terms of as we may mention, things that we got poor data compliance, you know, young young kids don't fill in their bowling workloads, which makes it harder. They don't have GPS like what we do. Had they had previous lumbar bone st stress injury, hip weakness, some things we found in our programs, they were getting short or less from, bowl from bowling in the off season, more back-to-back -back days, reduced fitness, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to think about a, a bit of an action plan. Now, there's a lot of stuff there, and I'm really lucky that I work in a multidisciplinary team. So I've got coaches, bowling coaches, physios, SNCs, dietitians that we have at, at our um, at our disposal. But there's a lot of things there that you guys, as coaches, can control. You know, things like bowling frequency, what your training sessions look like. You know, in terms of how long they bowl for. Do they bowl for you know an hour and then you come back and and then they move on to their next rotation or are they doing you know shorter spells and then doing fielding and then coming back again for a second session? 
you know, you guys can educate your players about the importance of rest between bowling sessions. You know, things like gradual build up of bowling intensity in the preseason and the preparation period. You know, do you do that? What's it look like? You know, does, does your bowler come in and day one of training and come in off the back, uh, you know, the back net, back fence, and then come charging in, try and, you know, is it is it bat versus ball um, session one? You know, there's, there's a lot of things there that you guys as coaches can control and to think about. So if I try and summarise my my component or, or my um, input tonight is that from a young fast bowlers are at risk of bone stress injury. We know that. It's the number one thing that will stop your, um, your players playing cricket. And that adolescence is this wonderful window of opportunity to increase bone strength, skill, technique, muscle strength, performance. And the main thing is, as Mark made mention earlier, is to love the game of cricket. If you've got fast bowlers who are out sitting on the sidelines, it's very, very difficult compared to their mates who are out on the park playing. Now, in order to load uh, loading bone safely, you need to allow for recovery time. And that fatigued bone, you know, is the loading is higher in a fatigued state. And the loading is high, higher when you're young and you're charging in and you bowl really, really fast. And from a performance element, which is where we work, you know, bowlers need to bowl to get better. But they have an individualised capacity for loading. So you need to think about your quicks individual and then we know that bony adaptation takes time and that you need to to play the long game you know think about how that this under 16 year old fast bowler is going to become the next mitchell stark or josh uh josh hazelwood thanks kieran um so, so that's kind of some of the background to, to the work that cricket australia have done in the last few years in regards to bowling recommendations and what well, they've actually changed this from uh, a few years ago and, and they've actually kind of tried to provide some guidelines as opposed to calling them restrictions and they're, they're restrictions for their guidelines for a reason. So the, the general rules are really simple. Avoid bowling more than two days in a row. Avoid bowling more than four days in a week. You know, these are these are simple things that we can adhere to. Allow it, try and allow an easy week. 50% uh, of, of the target that you can see on the right-hand side in, in regard to their age group, their target balls per week, every four or five weeks. Um, this is called, um, th this is kind of normal strength and conditioning style, um, like recommendations. And then schedule a week off bowling every 10 to 12 weeks. You know. For us, that's Christmas. That's fantastic. You know, that normally happens anyway. Um, I won't go into too much detail around how many balls and, types of preparation and the rest, we'll, we'll send this to you so you've got it as a reference, but it's also on the Cricket Australia coaching website, um, recommend you jump on. But from that point of view, two, four, you know, no more than two days in a row, no more than four days in a week, that's that's actually pretty simple. And then if you look at some of them, you know, no more than you know, four overs in a spell or six overs in a spell, it becomes, it becomes a reasonably simple kind of guideline. So, what I actually want to run through is what does this actually look like in reality? So what is it? Let's let's pick an under 17 year old kid. This kid can play um, is in is in rep cricket and, and plays grade. So you know, grade cricket's a two day game. They actually bowl that week. So you've got 16 overs that that kid can bowl. There's 16 plugged in and he's got a rep game. He's the number one quick. So he's definitely going to bowl his 10. So he's bowled 26 overs for the week so far, which is 156 balls. Now, CA and Cricket New South Wales recommend players at this age average, not every week, but average 120 to 150 balls per week. So he's kind of there. Now, we haven't discussed training or anything. So if, let's include two six-over spells of training, which isn't onerous and it isn't a great deal. So what we haven't included is school cricket, private coaching sessions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we've started to look at is that that total for this this week for this kid, 57% you know, of the mineral bone density, is looking at about 228 balls, which Kieran kind of mentioned was first class bowling load. So this is when we start to, um, you know, we, we start to expect kids to do what adults can do and, and not just adults. We're talking finely tuned athletes can do. So how we do this, this is this is where you you as coaches, I, I can imagine your brains are starting to tick over. Well, how do we run training sessions if quicks aren't going to bowl? Or how am I going to continue to have that player get better 
if they're not going to train? You know, these are really interesting questions to ask. And, and I'm going to be frank, the, the answers aren't very clear. There's some, and this is where it becomes about individual, and this is the road to load, and this is, you know, every which way you'll go. From the other point of view, let's let's pick the next week. Uh, no rep cricket, they're batting. Um, this is what their week looks like without training, just nothing. So at the moment, they're 120 to 150 balls short. So we plug in the, the six over spell. So let's say that, you know, we just run the same session week in, week out, or something very similar to it. They're bowling around 72 balls. So that, that's kind of unders of what we need. So it's not about just bowling too much. It's also about bowling too little. So I'm assuming that you're starting to think, and certainly this is where my brain's going, is, well, how do we start to either plan ahead or how do we react to the weekend before? Uh, and how do we do that well? And, and that's a bit, I'm going to be honest, that's a bit tricky. Now, some of you might say, well, I've kind of done the maths here, Mark, and, you know, surely this is all balancing itself out. Surely one really heavy week uh, equals one really low week. And sometimes it does. Sometimes it absolutely does. Sometimes it, the rain the rain causes the washout in the right time and everyone gets a break. Um, sometimes there's increased games at a time when they kind of need it. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's back-to-back -back games. So for now... For example, if there's any youth championship coaches in the metropolitan area, your fast bowlers are bowling two days a week, every week until December. Um, that's something to be considerate about. From a, uh, a green shield point of view, you know, there's, there's substantial bowling workloads in a really short period of time. For anyone involved in country cricket carnivals, you know, bowling four days on the trot is, is you know, that's it's nearly breaking the bank. So we need to be really aware of, you know, when this kind of balances out and when it kind of doesn't. You know, I'll, I'll use an example in the far north coast. Uh, there's a Friday night, fantastic idea, Friday night under 17s. So that kid plays Friday night. He plays Saturday morning club cricket. He plays Saturday afternoon LJ hooker league in first grade. And then he plays Sunday rep cricket. Um, these are That's a real example. This, this happens all the time. You know, the CHS carnival goes for five days where the kids bowl every day. So does it always balance itself out? No. Um, can we can we control some of this? Maybe, maybe not. So uh, I just want you to have a consideration of that when we, when we kind of move through the next few slides. So what does this actually look like over a season? Well, we'll try and provide some rough guidelines, I, I, I guess. The first one is let the kids have an off season. It's really important. I think Kieran's probably made enough, um, it's probably provided enough evidence to suggest that uh, they actually, we actually need these bones to recover. Like the, the bony edema that we see at the end of the year when we scan our kids is, it's almost a normal thing. Like I, I'm almost wondering if we get to the point where we just assume that they have low back stress fractures and we give them enough time to come back. Um, and so that 12 weeks is really important from a loading point of view. But it's also really important from a multi-sport point of view. We want kids to go and play soccer and footy and, and whatever it might be. And not having training during the first three months through through that um, autumn period is, is kind of important. Now, ignore the dates and ignore the amount of balls bowled and the rest of it because it's all going to be different depending on where you are and, and, and the cohort of bowler that you're working with. But the next kind of period of time is trying to get – them up to what you would consider normal kind of bowling workloads. And that's short run. It's your technique work that you need to do. It's, you know, less than 70% effort or intensity. So you, you're kind of getting from, you're starting with, you know, maybe even one step and walking through and doing your technical work that you need to do. And then every time that you're comfortable as a coach with them, their ability to hold their action, you might take them back two more steps. And that takes about four to six weeks anyway. So that's that's kind of the the time frame that we're looking for to try and get our bowlers up to how many balls they're roughly expected. Now, as an absolute number, if this was an under 17, if this was the same kid that we're talking about before, I'd probably suggest that these numbers are a bit low in the preseason, but it is what it is. We won't worry about semantics. So once we kind of get them up to speed, it's about increasing their intensity. So it's it's now about trying to increase intensity to full run match conditions so when we hit the first game they're ready to go and there's no surprises on the body 
well, as, as little as there possibly can be. So that's just increasing their intensity from 70 to 100. And again, you know, some of the technical changes that you may or may not have made through the season may dictate how quickly that occurs anyway. There's weather, there's all sorts of things. The next kind of little period is, is in season, you know, allowing natural peaks and troughs. There are times where it rains. There are times when you lose the toss and you're bowling and then you have to play the, the one-day game uh, the next day. There are times where there's green shield, you know, but we have, for, for every peak, we, we need a little bit of a trough and we need a little bit of a break. Um, and I think as long as we keep to those recommendations, ballpark's pretty good, you know, like it's it's a reasonable guideline in terms of how to – how to how to manage this really kind of weird situation that is bowling workloads. Now, the thing from a coach's point of view, like I'm looking at this saying, well, we've missed a golden opportunity for a number of reasons. One, this kid isn't going to play finals, which is what this is all about. Two, this kid isn't going to bowl as many balls as we want him to. So it might sound really counterproductive where we're looking at how many balls in a week a kid can get through or in a month or in a three month period, and we might need to pull them back from training a little bit, it's so they actually get through the year and they bowl more balls. It's actually about having bowlers bowl more, but smarter. So this this bowler hasn't bowled as many balls as they possibly can this year. They haven't maximized their individual ability. So the next year they've got catch up work to do, and that's that's tricky to do. So things we now know. There's lots of reasons why quicks get injured. We can't control some of these. In fact, we can't control many of those. We can control how much they bowl, particularly at training. Okay. We kind of want to prioritise our, our, our games. We want kids to learn the game and love the game. Planning sessions with fast bowlers in mind takes effort, and I'm sure that that's where your brain is, is swimming in at the moment. Like, how much time does it actually take to do? The answer is it does take a little bit. If we manage our fast bowlers really well, though, they play finals, coaches. You're starting to get it. You really want your fast bowlers to play finals. Think Mitchell Stark in the 2015 World Cup, people. It matters. So from my point of view, there's some really key learnings out of this. And it comes back to a little bit around the four Cs and connection. You know, you need a really strong connection with your quicks. You know, they need to trust you and you need to trust them with with them telling you the truth. You need to know how much they bowl. You need to know how many teams they're in. Uh, you need to you need to be aware of who they are as as quicks. Are they really tall and skinny? Do they bowl really fast? Are they in 15 teams? Is their action, you know, solid? You know, they have low counter rotation, low lateral flexion. And then the last one is to plan your sessions with your quicks in mind, and that's really hard to do. And from a from a coaching point of view. I generally plan my sessions with my quicks in mind first. So I book those in first. So I say, right, oh, my quicks are going to bowl here, here, and here, and they're going to bowl for X, X number of minutes because I know that's roughly, you know, if you're looking at roughly a ball a minute in a net environment, you can kind of work it out from there and say, right, they can bowl 24 balls here. They can have a break and they can come back and bowl another 24 balls. Don't use that as gospel. I've made those numbers up. So, that's kind of the tricky bit and that's the bit where you need a little bit of practice and that's the bit where you know from a from a coaching cohort we've got a lot of people on this call like this is the bit that if you're sitting around and you're talking with your opposition coaches this is stuff that you can actually talk to them about because it's a problem that everyone has and it's a challenge that everyone has so this comes down to really our training practices and how we go about it now for those that have been involved in, in some of the other um, fantastic effective coaching webinars, particularly one and two by Brett Rankin and Greg McClay, they spoke around the four C's and how different training impacts differently on the four C's, in particularly confidence and, and competence. Net environments are fantastic and efficient method of training players. I won't say they're effective, they can be effective, but they're not as effective. They are efficient. You can get 120 balls out of four quicks in 30 minutes in one net. Okay, that's really fast. Okay, but I want you to think about from that point of view, if you've only got four quicks in your team and they're all in the same net and they're all finished their bowling in 30 minutes, what does the rest of your net session look like? Um, I'm sure you've got to the point where it's like, my batters need to get better too. 
and I want them to get better. So how do they get better? Some of the things that you're potentially going to look at, you can look at planning rotations. You can minimise how many bowlers are in each net. Now, that might mean there's some downtime. But if you actually think about it from a coaching point of view and a development point of view, it probably allows a little bit more learning to occur in between these balls. It allows the batter and the bowler to reflect on their performance. It allows the batter to learn their routine and go through their routine. It allows the bowler to almost consider what he's going to bowl next ball, potentially even set a field within the scenario that the net scenario that you've provided. So efficiency is great. Effectiveness is better. So I think there's a few things that we can do and within a net environment if we're, confound, if we're confined to it. From a point that we've made before, like game environments are a far more effective way of delivering all of the four Cs. Nets typically improve someone's confidence, and we've spoken about this a little bit, in the fact that generally in a net environment with no instructions, certainly fast bowlers, will go back to what they're good at and they'll practice what they're good at, which is which is fine because that is their strength. But at times we need to challenge our players. We need to put them under pressure. We need to teach them how to set a field. You know, we need our batters to know their routines and to deal with pressure. We need them to be able to split split gaps. We need our fielding you know, to improve as well. So there's, there's a whole lot more that we can get out of game environments. And I really urge you to find centre wickets in your training in, in your training as you're trying to set up your training sessions now, um, trying to get centre wickets is actually really important. It may not be the most e efficient, but it certainly is effective of teaching the game. So things we know, nets are, nets are efficient, game scenarios and games are effective. The Cricket Australia bowling guidelines are a reasonable starting point. They really are. Um, we want to provide, uh, prioritise, sorry, games over training. I haven't mentioned this, but I think you're getting the point. Like fast bowlers that get treated like ball machines. So if they're there to treat to help batters play their cover drive, they're more likely to, to develop low back stress injuries. And fast bowlers that do that, they don't play finals. You, you kind of get the rest, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm banging on the drum, but you really want your quicks to get through the year. You really want them to play finals. So from that point of view, we're nearly done. And, and I really want to thank you for your time. And I really want to thank you for your participation, certainly early. I, I certainly hope that you, you've taken something out of that, particularly that second mentee question where I think the number one risk factor across the group was bowling balls in a session. And, and that kind of doesn't seem to be the case. It's more a longer term thing. So uh, I think we need to look at frequency and we need to look at rest periods and we need to look at educating our quicks and, and having a really good connection with them. Now, some of you might have wanted a little bit more technical work in this in this webinar. We can't cover everything. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to really strongly encourage you to jump on in the LMS, the learning management system that you actually registered in here. And I'd like you to search through the post community coach and pre representative coach learning modules. They're actually brilliant. Um, Mark Portis, who is the ex uh, Cricket Australia head of biomechanics runs through techniques, strategies and exercises to help people learn bowling. He, he's, he's quite the guru to be to be fair and he goes through it in a really simplistic way and I think it's certainly worth your time um, and I strongly encourage and it, it is a bit of a prerequisite for the representative course for those that haven't done it yet so strongly encourage you jump on press the launch learning button and and learn a little bit more around around their technical the technical aspects of of fast bowling from a I need more information and I need it to be personalized I'd love you to I'd love you to jump on and speak to your local coaching and talent specialist. So that's that's kind of there, and that'll be shared with you in in the email tomorrow. And you've also got my email address if you'd like to email myself personally as well. That'd be fantastic to hear from you. But I think for me, I I won't speak for Kieran, but uh, for me, thank you for your your participation. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate so many coaches jumping on, trying to get better, which is which is. It's, it's brilliant and the more the more we can share the good gospel around coaching the the better our players are going to be so thanks very much everybody thank you mark well done
Thanks, guys. That is fantastic. You get an applause. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you, Kieran. Thanks, Mark. Cheers, Mark. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Kieran. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, gentlemen.